And here he is, Andrew Stockdale from Wolf Mother. Officially, yeah. good to see you, man. Great to see you too. I'm yeah. glad we could finally, uh, yeah, make this happen. I know. Well, I yeah. said we were. We both did. I hosted a gig that you played with Wolf Mother in Houston. Yeah. At that brewery. Yeah. Which was what? What that was like less than a year ago, I guess. Because yeah. they're doing it again coming up. Oh. And uh, without us, without you, well, they can't. Bring, <laughs> they can't do Wolf Mother every year. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I re what I remember about that was two things. First of all, it was a very eclectic bill it was like the sweet april wine wolf mother when i looked at the billing i'll be honest with you going into that i was just like is this going to really work like this really bands come bands coming from different eras or whatever yeah. and it did and the place was really cool that yeah. brewery carbach brewery it was yeah. really a cool gig yeah. but then i don't know if i had ever seen you and i had met a couple of times but i don't know if i ever saw wolf mother play and i remember standing out there and being fucking floored awesome. at how killer and i and remember wow. i texted you and i was just like that's the way to do it man that was yeah. just like <laughs> badass you you played as a trio it was yeah. three guys yeah. and you just massive like riffs and you singing great and i was like you know, one of my big peeves, yeah. Andrew, is I am so over and sick of rock bands playing to tracks and having fake vocals and instruments and all this bullshit going on. Yeah. And you went up there and you plugged in and just went for it. Hey, and it thanks. was fucking killer, man. And I came on this show right afterwards when the next day I got back on the air and I was raving about seeing oh. Wolf Mother and how good you guys were. And thanks. I remember you had sent me a text. You are just like, yeah, man, we're just going for it and just kind of stripped down and just doing our thing. And yeah. it was really, really cool. So Yeah, yeah, thanks. What, what are Appreciate you doing that. now? You came over to the U.S. to do a handful of dates. We have a European tour starting up in uh, like a 30-day tour with festivals and everything. And I thought rather than fly from Australia to Dubai or Singapore up to Europe. I thought, why not go to LA, do four shows there, record in a few studios. I went to Dave Grohl's studio for two days. Oh, in his house, the one in his garage? 606. Oh, okay. Which I, I heard your uh, um, your story about the fundraiser that he well, Dave just showed and, up. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's in Encino. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I host a, a cancer charity event for Ronnie James Dio's uh, foundation. Yeah. And we do an event. We do two events a year, but one is in a park in Encino, and a bunch of people jam. Yeah. And, I, and then Dave showed up and uh, got up and jammed a couple songs that day. So it was yeah. really cool of him to do it. He lives right by that park, he told me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But his his because yeah. I know they did a Foo Fighters record. He always says in his garage. I'm sure his garage is nicer is than most than people's most houses. Top notch studios. Right, right. <laughs> but he actually uses it. Lets other people come there and record. He'll actually sub that out. Yeah. Uh, well, I just got in touch with uh, uh, his keyboard player, mm -hmm. Rami. Okay. And he's like, hey, um, I can put you in the studio if you want to use, you know, six oh six. And I was like, yeah. Because we did both of our first records on that desk, the Sound City desk. Oh, he bought. That's right. Because there's a documentary about Sound City. Yeah. That he did, and he took the console and put it in his, his studio. Studio, yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's the connection. I yeah. get it. Yeah. So uh, it was funny seeing that desk that used to be like the holy grail. Like, right. You, know, you wouldn't go near it, and now they've just they've just got it there and actually I, using it. Yeah, it just felt. It felt like when I made my first record, there was like three engineers, and the one who sat at that desk was just like holding the fort. You know what I mean? Like right. he's gonna destroy you if you looked at it the wrong way. <laughs> but now it's kind of they've got it. It's a friendlier app. Like his people are super friendly. Yeah. Well, so is Dave. Dave. I mean, yeah. Dave's the front man of one of the biggest rock bands on the planet with yeah. Foo Fighters, but he's like the most unassuming regular dude. You know, yeah. I always respected that about him. Yeah. I mean, he's always just, he's, he's, if you run into him, like very approachable. Even the um, thing we did just a month or so ago in Encino, he walked by with his kids and he walked in and he said, hey, what's going on here? And I said, you know, everyone told him. And then the next thing you know, uh, he said, I'm going to go take my kids home and then I'll come back. Yeah, and yeah. sure enough, he came back. He went out to the food trucks, bought him some food. Like just a, a totally great dude. Yeah, he really is. He always yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's so, that's cool though. That so then you so you did you do the shows in L.A. already? Well, I recorded two songs there. Then I did five or oh yeah, we had a show in Mexico too, which was insane. 
which is one of the I'll, I'll show you the footage on on our Instagram, but it's just like this riot. Headline show? Uh, we were second to the headline. Okay, so who yeah, else was on the bill? About 50,000 people. Uh, Interpol. Okay. So we were kind of like the rough and ready rock band, and they were like the sophisticated right. black suit kind of <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> intellectual band. But um, So, there, yeah, we had that, and then we went. Then I flew straight from Mexico up, up here. So you day. did you did a few shows in the L.A. area, in California. Yeah. Then you went into Dave Grohl's studio, recorded a few things. You did the thing in Mexico. Yeah. And now you're here in New York City. Yeah. And you're playing Irving Plaza here in New York tonight. Yeah. And then tomorrow you said you're at the Stone Pony in New Jersey? Uh, yeah, tomorrow. yeah, yeah, yeah. So how many dates left? Just a few dates, just a handful, and then what are you going back to Australia? Three more shows here on the East Coast, and then 27 shows oh, Europe. through Europe. Um, we're doing uh, Lollapalooza in Stockholm. Uh, Mad- There's a Lollapalooza in Stockholm. Yeah, yeah. Europe has been massive for us for years. Hey, it's almost like I would say, you know, when you add up all the tickets of like all your shows, and, right? Uh, like I think here it was about fifty to a hundred thousand or something, but there it's just we stopped counting six hundred. If you include all the festivals and head, it just goes on and on. So the tour you're doing coming up of Europe is it is it all headline dates beyond that one or two festivals or about uh, fifteen headline shows and the rest maybe ten festivals. And how many people you say Europe is so strong for Wolf Mother? How many mm. people do you average as a headline straight headline there? What what size? It menus? varies. It varies. Two thousand one to two thousand most nights, or but in Germany, like you can go to these. Towns like Cologne. Have you ever been there? No. K L O N E. And we get five thousand people, and these guys stand on each other's shoulders. Uh, like one guy's on one guy's shoulder, then there's another guy, three or four or five dudes in these towers. They're like nuts, eh? <laughs> towers of dudes <laughs> yeah. watching Wolf Mother. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in Germany. That's why I imagine them with like big goblets of beer in their hand while they're watching as well. It's like that. <laughs> it is. <yeah. laughs> so let me let me go back to the Wolf Mother story, if we can. You mentioned making that first record. Yeah, which is what fifteen years Man, now. Our credit, our record label that we were signed to, we were in there doing the record with Dave Sardi, and the guy who had a record label, his credit card bounced. He couldn't even pay for the first day of the studio. What label was that? <laughs> Were you guys signed to Interscope? Modular. And he sold. We Interscope wanted to buy, uh, wanted to sign Wolf Mother, and the guy who owned our record label said, if you want Wolf Mother, you have to buy our record label. So he saw all these bands got, uh, you know, leveraged into the States via us. Oh, I see. And other bands like, you know, Tam and Parlor, they were other signings that came in after us. You know, they were like, we need another Wolf Mother. Yeah, so the- but they've gone more psychedelic and they've more, you know, sort of dancey kind of electro kind right. of thing now. But- so the guy who signed you, this label modular, whose credit card was bouncing <laughs> while you're making your first <laughs> record, what, what, um, how, what was his hook to Wolf Mother? Is he, was he Australian or is he Australian? Australian guy. So it was you were signed in Australia initially. Yeah. He wanted to sign us after the third gig. What how long had Wolf Mother existed before you got signed? Three gigs. Three gigs. Three gigs. Wow. Three gi- we didn't like um Yeah, we had uh we had Woman, Dimension, Love Train, White Unicorn, four songs. We had a fifteen minute set and that's what we played. So you didn't, it wasn't one of these things where you were pounding the pavement forever trying to get going. It was, Instant it happened success. right out of the gate. Inst- like, I've never experienced anything like it or anything since. It was just like, it, we started a, a website back then with, you know, 40 emails. Would you play here? Would you fly here? I think we came to New York like two weeks after we got signed. We played in a shop um, down in Soho. Did you yeah. did you uh, did you have bands before Wolf Mother that we don't know about in in Australia? All like terrible amateur bands, <laughs> hey, 
terrible bands that you know what came last in Battle of the Bands and oh really yeah like but <clears throat> when we started Wolf Mother we were going to audition for a singer because I wasn't I was just like the guitarist like the you know tag along kind of vibe guy did you not want to sing or you didn't know you could I didn't think I was qualified for oh. the gig you know yeah like we made posters and stuff to audition singers and then I um well I made my own little solo demo uh away from the band and then I got a gig and then I asked them to come in and join me and then I kind of you know I was like it's not gonna be like the beastie boys it's not gonna be like shoegazer it's gonna be riffs it's gonna you know I saw we had woman and that was like a power chord driven sort of song and that was once we had woman it was like let's make 10 songs like that and i'm still on that kind of trajectory now yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that now you said that prior to that you were in college for photography yeah yeah and what what did you what was the if the music thing didn't work out for you what was the goal to be a photographer for what 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 did you want to shoot like what were you studying for uh well yeah i, I was um well, I started off doing fashion. Oh, okay. Would you believe it? Oh. <laughs> better look, better looking at mo fashion models than looking at dudes in rock bands, I would think, right? I was doing models tests and all this kind of stuff, and I sort of, uh, by the end of that, I was, um, yeah, I was in a squat. Like, and you know, like around here, you see like a, a level of a building that's just abandoned, say in yeah. Times Square or yeah, something. Yeah. And they rent it out to artists, and I just wound up in this uh, abandoned warehouse. Living there or working yeah. there? Living there. Living there. So did you grow up poor? Did you grow up in poverty? Uh, well, like, as a, no, as a lower, well, it's hard to say. Well, middle class, you know, sort of lower middle class suburban delusions of grandeur you know like right but kind of, but now you're you're out on your own and that's what you're able to afford yeah yeah so, so you're kind of putting your your dues in yeah 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 no i was like you know my parents uh you know if you wanted, wanted to go back there you had yeah, a room a, i could yeah if, yeah, I, yeah, yeah if i failed i could yeah you had fall a backup back plan. on something you know right. but i that yeah so i just wound up in an inner city kind of warehouse and and then started demoing songs whilst i was doing photography and the whole thing, like, you know, you know those people who do, like, paintings or whatever, and they're always showing their friends a painting, and they're, like, terrible their whole life, but no one has the guts to tell them? <laughs> yeah. Most bands, most yeah. bands with their demos, that's what yeah. happens. That, to me, I tell bands that all the time. I'm like, the biggest obstacle you have is you don't have anybody in your inner circle willing to tell you it's not good enough yet. Yeah. Because your friends, your girlfriends, your wives, they're all going to tell you it's great. So you get it. Oh, totally. And the no, and they, so I didn't want to be one of those people, you know, and I thought maybe I was, and that's, so I booked in the first. That you sucked, but no one was willing to yeah, tell you you sucked? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I booked in the first gig, and I said to my girlfriend, I was like, if I suck, just tell me, <laughs> and I'll stop music, because I'm always sitting on the couch playing the guitar. But see, here's the problem, Andrew. Let me just jump in on this. You see, you say that to your girlfriend, right? Me in my position over the decades, I've had a million bands come to me and they'll give me their demo or they'll say, I want you to tell me what you really think. No, oh. I want to tell you really. And then if I tell them yeah. the truth, which 99% of the time is it's not good enough, oh, you fucking, you keep talking shit about me. or They can't handle it. Oh, yeah. So it's like the double-edged sword. It's like, but wait, you told me you wanted the truth yeah. from me. I'm not telling you that I'm the be beginning and end of everything. I'm just telling you from my perspective, you wanted my opinion. Yeah. You get it. And no one is willing to tell them that, you know, you need to go back and work more on it. And if you didn't like them or didn't, you know, if you wanted to just keep them in the dark, you'd be like, that's great, man. You know <laughs> exactly. what I mean? If you wanted to just waste your life continuing on this, you know, you could tell them that, right. but you feel like, hey, I'll give you some honest feedback, you know, like, and then it's like, boom. Yeah. You, you shit talk to my band where... Yeah, and that's just it. You know, that's honestly, that's the number one problem I see with aspiring bands, especially today where anyone can make music and it's so overcrowded and the market's so flooded and you can put out music in so many different ways that 
I see these bands that are out there and pounding away for decades, years, and they can't figure out why nothing's happening. Yeah. Because no one has this balls to tell them, guys, it's just not good enough. Yeah. You need yeah. better songs. You need this. You need that. Because they've mm -hmm. surrounded themselves with people that are just telling them what they want to hear, reinforcing yeah. the fact that they're great when they're not. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Like, we were good. You know what I mean? Like, right out of the gate. It's funny. Like, when something is naturally good, it will experience success. Right. I agree with that. It'll so find its way. We had this nice pocket of time where, it, like, everything started selling out. Everything, um, like, we experienced all this success. But then there becomes this upper echelon of press, social, uh, like, society. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, conformity within, like, hearsay, uh, like, how good your bio is or your publicist. And then there's, like, a kind of, like, a brainwashing consciousness of, of a perception of you or something that happens, which is, like, kind of like the second level of being good. And then you have to kind of, you know what I mean? You have to... Reach higher. You have to come up. Like, I remember back then, you know, Jack White would say he's drummers his sister or you have to have some hook long-winded story to that to to appeal to to journalists like, right you know you know what i mean like right. you got, where, where there's got to be more than than just great music to get to the next level there's going to be some story some drama some additional hook a story yeah 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 and even then, if it's fabricated it's got to be there and that's that's kind of um which i think is kind of false to an extent you know like i think you can get you can lose your sort of you can lose yourself in that a bit you know what i mean yeah well did I, you find that happening were you guys pressured into that i mean the first wolf mother record comes out does really well all over the world especially here in america yeah and then all of a sudden like you know and then then did the guy who couldn't pay for the record label yeah you eventually transitioned to a major label right you eventually did you did the go whole thing of going to interscope yeah. right yeah and then what happens from there because you had <laughs> you're you're the the arc of wolf mother is like a uh yeah uh a, a, a what do they call it a bell curve like it's up and down it's yeah. up and down even yeah. lineups have changed yeah. a lot yeah and even the band was kind of away for a little bit and then mm. came back and then you did solo things and so so it's been a hell of a ride yeah. hasn't it oh i mean if you look wolf mother up on google it says the first article is why wolf mother had to end from you know 2013 <laughs> when you're playing a show tonight in new york city yeah and i have been for you know 12 <laughs> years but they've got the search and you know they've got the powerful server right like you know i don't know fairfax or whatever whoever you know so you're right there's this virtual perception of of what we're doing and the reality of of sold out shows around the world for 15 years or close to maybe 50 short or 200 short or whatever you know but. right but now the band there's been a lot of people in and out of the band and i know over the mm. years but now you would agree that the band is synonymous with you i mean you are the i mean there's a lot of it bands rests that, on my shoulders yes i've got to make if the the more i can put into it um the better the more successful it, it will be you know because when you sing and play guitar i'm not like a page and plant or a mick and keith or you know, I'm not like... Tyler when, Perry. Yeah, ty uh, yeah, you read my mind. Wait. Right. Um, so when you do both, you kind of, you're kind you're in a p powerful position, I think, musically speaking, because you can write, you can sing, you can do the riffs. You know, I play the drums or whatever. So. so who else is in the band with you now? Is it still a trio? Same guys that you saw last Same time. Same guys. Um, yeah, Hamish has been in the band for about six years or six or seven years uh and brad uh healed he's been in the band for about a year it's funny like to, for me it feels like yesterday but it's like yeah a year has passed since his first gig now um, are those guys australian as well australian and we've got a a guy leo um Munz. he's from a band called the love gang which is sort of like a motorhead kind of band and 
He he's playing keys at the moment. I think when you saw us, we didn't have keys. No, it was three. It was three guys. And I really, we usually have keys. But um, I don't. I, I'm sure it sounds great with keys, but I loved the trio thing, man. Because the keys can block out. They just take up that whole sonic space. To me, the there's never enough. There's, you can never have too much guitar. Yeah. And big guitar tone and sound. And that's what yeah. I'm saying, man. It, it, that show that I saw in Houston, I mean, you, you, you guys just, I mean, it just killed. It was like, it was like a, a bulldozer, man. It was just, you just came out and just kept pounding away. And there's the riffs and, and, you know, your voice is, uh, it, it's, it's funny to learn that you were auditioning singers because your voice is, such a signature thing about Wolf Mother. It's so powerful. Yeah. And yeah. it's amazing that you actually weren't even going to be the singer originally. Well, it takes a while for, you know, sometimes a social dynamic is different to a musical ability, you know, when you're hanging out with your friends and the, the, the position that you take within your friends. And once you start playing music, then everyone else's abilities kind of kind of uh, mm. reveal themselves yeah well the other thing too is is there's people like to you you have to want to be